The first time anyone ever got a good look at Jack the Ripper was on the morning of September 8, 1888, shortly before he killed his second victim, Annie Chapman. Then, a woman bustling down Hanbury Street at around 5.30 a.m. noticed a man and a woman talking. The witness only saw the man's back, but she later recalled that he looked like a foreigner, that he was of average height, that he was wrapped in a dark cloak, and that he was wearing a deerstalker hat, just like in some depictions of the fictional detective Sherlock Holmes. The witness saw the man talking with Chapman, who she later identified to the police. She heard the man say, will you? To which Chapman replied, yes. Then the witness hurried on. She didn't know it then, but she was the last person to ever see Annie Chapman alive. And she was among the first, and certainly the few, to catch a glimpse of Jack the Ripper. Exactly what transpired between Chapman and the serial killer over the next 20 minutes is impossible to know today. But we understand the aftermath all too well. Chapman and the killer ducked into a passageway that connected backyards on Hanbury Street, presumably because the killer had promised to pay Chapman for sex. Then, he viciously attacked her. When Annie Chapman's body was discovered, dissected, and mutilated later that morning, London police made the grim determination that there was a monster on the loose in Whitechapel. Chapman's death bore a striking and unsettling resemblance to the murder of Mary Ann Nichols, who had been found dead just a week earlier. Both women were poor, both were sex workers, and both had been brutally attacked with a knife. Indeed, even the men who found Chapman's body were sure that it was the work of the same man. News of Nichols' barbaric murder had ricocheted through Whitechapel, and as they rushed toward a police constable to tell him what they'd found, they cried, Another woman has been murdered. So who was Annie Chapman? How did she end up in a cycle of poverty in the seedy area of Whitechapel? And how did she come to cross paths with Jack the Ripper on September 8, 1888? Here's the tragic story of Jack the Ripper's second victim, and how Chapman's brutal death spread fear throughout London, spurned the police to start arresting suspects, and even sparked a response from the killer himself. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting staff writer Kalina Fraga. And I'm All That's Interesting staff writer Austin Harvey. And you're listening to the second episode in our series on Jack the Ripper, one of history's most infamous serial killers. He is one of history's most infamous serial killers. He is indeed. Infamy from anonymity, perhaps. Ooh. But- I like that. Hey, yeah, that's a good tagline. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a good, like, if we did, like, a spinoff podcast and we just had to, it was just about Jack the Ripper, that'd be a great title for it. Or about serial killers that no one has ever identified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there we go. Now we're talking. I'm trying to think who else that would be. So Jack the Ripper. Um, That's fine. We should know this. Well, so the problem is every time I have to write about a serial killer, it feels like it's right because they've been caught. Right. Like I just did an update about the Long Island serial killer, but they like are pretty sure they know who it is oh. now. Oh, yeah. Right. Innocent until proven guilty, but seems pretty guilty. The Boston Strangler. Oh, that's good. I guess they think they know who did yeah. that. The Zodiac Killer. Oh, that's a good one. The Doodler. I've never heard of the Doodler. I haven't either. The Belize Ripper. Oh, so they're out there. Yeah, there's enough that you could... Huh. The Cape Town Prostitute Killer. That's not a very creative name. No, that's what I was just about to say. Some of these are very, <laughs> like, very neat uh, names, and then some of them are really, really dumb. Yeah. Plus, I think Ripper is overused. There's also, like, the Yorkshire Ripper. Yeah. Although I think he was identified. I'm not sure. Yeah. I like how sometimes it's just... There's just no consistency to how you name serial killers. It's like... Like one of them is Dr. No. Ooh, that's. Mm. I mean, we shouldn't be giving them cool names realistically. Right. Calling somebody the doodler is a very funny way to like make fun of them. I kind of remember that now, actually. For some reason, I don't know if we wrote about that or. Um, He is on our list of nine of the most deranged California serial killers in history. Oh, I think I wrote that. <laughs> That's probably why it sounds did. familiar. <laughs> From Yeah, you did. End of 2022. Ooh. Literally the yeah. first one is the doodler. <laughs> That's why. Oh, that's funny. California serial killers. Yeah, there are a lot of those as well. Yeah. I wonder if that's just because there's a lot of uh, 
people in California. You, uh, you also have <laughs> from the doodler to the vampire of Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, I also thought a good pitch would be like Seattle serial killers because there's like a handful. There's Ted Bundy and the Green River Killer and yeah, some others. I'm pretty sure there's an active serial killer in Pittsburgh right now. Oh, really? Yeah, there was um, apparently a couple people went missing from this same bar, like guys my age or younger. Oh, and they all have been like found in one of the rivers here. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that, actually. And it's a bar I went to when I was like 23. So scary. Oh, glad to be here. We're going to talk today about Annie Chapman, who was the second victim of Jack the Ripper. She was born in 1840 and had a very traumatic and horrible childhood. Her brother later said that their father cut his own throat while they were still children, which would do things to you psychologically, yeah, I imagine. That's really dark. Not the way I'd want to go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a result of this, she started drinking very young, unsurprisingly. And she earned the nickname Dark Annie, although it was because of her hair, apparently, and not because of her demeanor, her demeanor or the dark thing she suffered in her past. Um, so that was sort of a, a rough childhood Oof, and things yeah. did not get better as she grew up. She married a man named John Chapman in 1869. They had three children, but one was born disabled and was later surrendered to an institution, as they called them at the time, I suppose. Yeah. Eesh. This made her her dependency on alcohol much worse. She and her husband drank a lot. Uh, and even though they were both drinkers, a police report blamed her drunken and immoral ways for the end of their marriage in the 1880s. Although John died of cirrhosis of the liver and dropsy shortly uh, there afterwards. Oof. Yeah. And that was really, that was like a double whammy for her because until his death, he'd been giving her 10 shillings a week, which helped her to supplement her income of doing like odd jobs. Right. So now her husband's dead. Um, she has no allowance from him anymore. So she turns to sex work instead to make ends meet. By 1888, the year that she dies... She's 47 years old, but she's spending her nights at lodging houses across Whitechapel. She was very often at Crossingham's Lodging House on 25 Dorset Street with some 300 other people who saw her as sort of a tragic figure. She seemed to be suffering, in their opinion, from tuberculosis and syphilis. Oof. Yeah. Not good. Not good for sex uh, work. No. Although I think a lot of people at that time. Yeah. yeah. The house manager described her as inoffensive, but she apparently got in a fight with a fellow female lodger in the days before her death, possibly over a man and possibly over a bar of soap. Two very different things to fight Yes. Over. I don't know which one's sadder. They're both pretty sad. Yeah, I think maybe the bar of soap. Mm, maybe so. She was, in any case, like pretty ill in the days leading up to her murder. Uh, a friend of hers remembered her saying that she was too ill to do anything and she was seen with pills, lotion, and a bottle of medicine before she died. Me looking over at my shelf that has hand lotion, my pills, and some <laughs> vitamins on it, like, ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you and Annie Chapman. Yikes. Some believe that she was actually dying at this point at the age of 47, but she might have just been suffering from syphilis. Yeah. Uh, either way, things were not going great for her at this moment of time. What you kind of reminded me of this earlier I forgot how, like, not necessarily young these women were. Right. Or at least uh, Annie Chapman and Marianne Nichols. Interesting that they were. These first two, yeah. Yeah. Older. Um, or in their 40s, anyway. Yeah. I mean, for the time, that was older. Older, yeah. And also, it just kind of shows, like, the situation they found themselves in. They weren't young women out in the world. Well, if they'd been young, they probably would have been married, which they were when they were young, which right. offered them probably some protection from needing to go out right. to perform. But it, upsetting, and it shows the position that women were in in the late 1800s in London, where if their husbands died and things weren't going well for them, they didn't have a lot of options to turn to. No, and so it very few options. It adds like a layer of like extra desperation to these situations where it's like, oh, they had to do this because what else could they do? And Chapman and Marianne Nichols were also alcoholics. Right. And like Marianne Nichols got a job. Like she, for like a brief period of time, and then she was like, whatever, and stole right. stuff well, from yeah. her employer. And, you yeah. know, so it's like they had some options. But I think if you're an alcoholic and you're so sick and you're alone, sex work is the easiest and quickest right. thing to do. Interesting, too, that they both had children, but like mm -hmm. were just estranged from them for whatever reason. 
probably alcoholism right, yeah. con- contributes to that. Yeah. Well, Annie Chapman's life ended on September 7th. On her last night alive, she had a beer with a fellow lodger and then went out around 1 a.m. to get a baked potato for breakfast, which is sort of quaint um, yeah. and tragic because it was at the end of her life. When she returned, the house manager asked if she had money for a bed and Chapman didn't. I think this is the same thing that happened to Marianne Nichols. She came back and didn't have the money. She asked him to hold a bed for her while she went to get some money and told him, I'll soon be back. She left around 2 a.m. and never returned. Oof. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of similarities here with Marianne Nichols then. Yeah. They're actually on very parallel yeah. tracks in most ways. Like even like time of day. Uh-huh. Yeah. The fact that they both... It's interesting to think, and it makes sense for these lodging houses that they would take payment up front, but it is like just from me not knowing too much about like life in 1888 London, but just mm-hmm. what I can glean from these two stories is like, oh, okay, so like there were a lot of lodging houses in Whitechapel that people stayed in who were kind of like drifters who weren't very stable. They were cheap housing, but like you paid up front. So if you didn't have the money, you're like, I got to yeah. go get that right now or I won't have anywhere to sleep tonight. Right. Yeah. And for women like Annie Chapman and Mary Nichols, there was a very easy way to get what you needed. Right. To either get a drink or get a bed. So maybe both. Yeah. I do think, I mean, obviously, for someone like Jack the Ripper, this place is like Whitechapel and these lodging houses are rife with potential victims, people who won't be noticed. Right. If they go, if they die, I guess they don't go missing. It's yeah. like the same reason um, the stereotype of like, someone who kills hitchhikers here in America, Mm -hmm. where so many people travel across the country on road trips or whatever. They're drifters who are like trying to get out to California. So they're just hitchhiking their way there. It's the same kind of like stereotype. I don't know how many people are actually killing hitchhikers, but I know that's very common perception. Well, I mean, to this day, I think sex workers are in like great danger of being killed and people like the green river killer targeted sex workers like that was his thing and it took a long time to figure out what was going on because people don't notice um necessarily when they go missing yeah and i think there's also this like i mean there is definitely a stigma surrounding sex work and i think men have historically been very angered by promiscuous women Mm -hmm. and there's a very clear from jack the ripper's letters and stuff there's a clear anger and hatred towards sex workers yeah so for sure and we'll get into that like a bunch i bet in our last yeah. episode but like what his motives were and that was certainly um i mean who knows what this guy was thinking he might have been a lunatic yeah. i think i made the joke jack the ripper was like the original incel but it's like kind of true <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah yeah i mean he certainly had a lot of hate in his yeah. like he his mindset not all that different from like elliot rogers mm-hmm. yeah i think there's parallels to be drawn there yeah. definitely Yeah, so Annie Chapman leaves to get money, hopefully to get a bed. Of course, she doesn't end up doing that. It's it's just unclear what she does the next several several hours, but eventually around 5.30, she crosses paths with Jack the Ripper. Oh, wow. A witness later comes forward named Elizabeth Long, who says that she saw Chapman with a man. And this is like one of the only descriptions of him. She described the man as being medium height. She said he looked like a foreigner. He was wrapped in a dark cloak and wearing a deer hunter hat. Hmm. So that's sort of a vague description. I mean, that could be. What do they mean by deer hunter hat? It's like what Sherlock Holmes wears. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So not something that would really stand out necessarily. Right. Um, and it's kind of unclear what she means by foreigner. Maybe someone with like a like a darker complexion that's or something. But what I assumed. I don't think you would look at unclear. someone who's like, if you're in London, you look at someone who's German and you can glean from a distance in the middle of the night. Like, that's a foreigner. Like, I think they'd have to. I mean, maybe. I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. But it sounds like from his Difficult f- to fashion say. and stuff, he wasn't dressed in a way that would indicate foreigner yeah so well that was her that was her impression anyway and she noticed they were standing against number 29 on hanbury street and long says she heard the man say will you and chapman replied yes so this seems like some sort of deal being made probably for sex so they go into this passageway in the backyard of number 29 and then about 15 minutes later, a man who lives at number 27 is in the adjacent backyard and he hears a woman say no and a thump. But he thinks of nothing of it and just goes on with his life. 
So that's kind of sad. But I guess at that point, there was nothing much he could have done anyway. Right. Yeah. About 15 minutes later, one of the residents of number 29 named John Davis would traverse the backyard to get onto Hanbury Street. And in the backyard, he finds Annie Chapman. She's lying on the ground near the fence. Her head is turned toward the house. Her skirts have been pulled up to her waist, which is exposing her red and white stockings. Her face and hands are covered in blood. Um, And Davis, horrified, obviously runs into the street and flags down three workmen to come and see. So they follow and see Chapman's body. One of the workmen, whose name is James Kent, said, I could see that the woman was dead. She had some kind of handkerchief around her throat, which seemed soaked in blood. The face and hands were besmeared with blood, as if she had struggled. They run out again to find a police constable named John Chandler, and they tell him another woman has been murdered, which seems telling. They knew about Nichols' murder, and this was another woman who had been murdered. Right, in a very similar fashion. The skirt hiked up. Very similar fashion. Blood everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Marion Nichols was also found in the early morning hours. Yeah, I think it was like 3.30. But as people were getting ready to go to work, they found her body. Yeah, both women were killed under the cover of darkness. Yes. Police get there pretty quickly by 6, 10 in the morning, the doctor 20 minutes later, and they find that her murder was even more vicious than Nichols' murder was. And Nichols was also pretty vicious. The doctor says, and I won't read like all of this, but just some parts of it, He says that the body was terribly mutilated. The throat was cut. There was blood on the wood paneling near her. Her abdomen had been, he said, laid open. The intestines had been lifted out and placed on the shoulder of the corpse. Yeah. He says the upper portion of her vagina and part of her bladder had been entirely removed. No trace of these parts had been found. And he said it's obviously the work of an expert, someone who has anatomical or pathological like knowledge about these things. He also says that it couldn't have happened in 15 minutes. It must have taken an hour, which given the time isn't like that. Right. It did take 15 minutes. It was very quick. So it seems like it's someone who knew what they were doing and acted quickly and then just like disappeared. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a very short amount of time to do Do all that damage. Yeah. But it seemed with enough like witnesses on either side of the murder, like it seems like that's what happened. Yeah, It's a very narrow time frame. Yeah. Very quickly, newspapers get involved. One local newspaper writes, another murder of a character even more diabolical than that perpetrated in Bucks Row was discovered in the same neighborhood. That's Marianne Nichols, of course. They say the woman's body had been completely ripped open. There's Jack the Ripper for you. Ah, right. Another newspaper says, the excitement has, as we say, been intense. The terror is extreme. And they write about how people were coming to the yard and paying money to see the blood spattered on the fence. (laughs) Which is uh, horrible. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's not surprising. Uh, There's always been a weird fascination with the macabre. And obviously, the true crime genre is very popular. Yeah. I think this is an interesting turning point in the Jack Ripper case. Now that it's getting this publicity and not just like publicity, but like they're really the terror. the, The excitement has been intense. The terror is extreme. They're really like pushing this story. Right. And people are responding to it. Which I think we can talk about more down the line, but that's one reason why this story I think is stuck is that the newspapers were vividly reporting what had happened. Right. Because, yeah, at any point in history, there could have been any number of serial killers that just went unnoticed because, you know, an, an English village in the countryside and someone came through right. and killed three people. But it was just like, I don't know, people died back then. There was no way to report it. Yeah, right. In any case, this lights a fire under the police and they start making some arrests. One of the people they arrest is a guy named John Pizer. He's also known as Leather Apron, which is a good uh, name if you're mm. a potential serial killer suspect. Well, they Leather Apron. He was referenced in the Dear Boss letter, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. He was known to carry around a knife and mistreat sex workers. Uh, pretty good suspect. Yeah. A Leather Apron was found at number 29 where Annie Chapman was killed, but it belonged to someone else and he was let go. Another man who was arrested was named William Pickett. He had a bite mark on his hand, which he said came from a woman he tried to help as she was having a fit, which sounds pretty sketch to me. Yeah, but you know, those women, they're crazy. I know. These women are always always hysterical out here. He was trying to help her and she bit him. Yeah. He also had blood on his clothing, also suspicious. 
but he was dismissed as a lunatic, and later in his life, he was institutionalized. Well, that seems like a pretty good suspect, then. He also seems like a good suspect. I love that. I love that phrasing. <laughs> dismissed as a lunatic. They were like, we're looking for someone who might have killed two women in Whitechapel. Let's talk to this man. Oh, he couldn't have done it. He's a lunatic. It's like, no, what do you <laughs> He's mean? He's a lunatic. <laughs> He could definitely the do it. The He's a lunatic. The first guy you look at. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he was dismissed. That's funny. And then they also suspected a man named John Richardson who had passed through the backyard to fix his boot, but he was not really a serious yeah. suspect. He was just trying to fix his boot. He was just trying to fix his boot. Like his boot that he was wearing or like the boot of his carriage? Because that's what they say for uh, The boot he was wearing. Okay. Yeah. I, just, I, just wanted, good, yes. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then a couple of weeks after this, the case takes another exciting twist when police received the Dear Boss letter that you mentioned, which is very mocking of the investigation. Um, it reads in part, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. They say I'm a doctor now. Ha ha. That's the one where he adds like, P.S. Don't mind me giving the trade a name. Yeah. So he names himself Jack the Ripper right. in this letter. Which gives him a name. Yeah, which was after the newspaper headline came out about her being ripped open. Yes. So, okay, that makes sense then. There is some, like, all of the letters in this case have been very difficult to know if they are authentic. The newspapers did have a reason to send letters like this just right. to have some more things to write about. But from this point on, the killer has a name, two women are dead, and pretty soon more would be yeah. killed as well. Imagine if that letter wasn't sent by the killer and it was just sent by some person. And then they were like, I did. I named him. It was me. <laughs> They're like bragging yeah. to all their friends at the bar. They're like, yeah, I wrote that letter. I'm not the killer, but I wrote it. I feel like that would get back to the police somehow. That would then, definitely would but get maybe back not. to the police. Yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting. People have speculated that it's harder to be a serial killer today because of so much technology. And there's things like, OK, this guy, Piggott, who's the lunatic. He had blood on his clothing. He had a bite mark on his hand. Right. Now you could compare that, the bite mark to Andy Chapman's teeth. You could test the blood on his clothing with her blood. Right. You know, there'd be like more ways to check boxes than to be like, well, he's a lunatic. Let's yeah. look elsewhere. I mean, you no, know, it's crazy that people get away with being serial killers nowadays, especially yeah. people who aren't like the Golden Gate killer who aren't in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, I was just updating something about the uh, Long Island serial killer. And it's like now they were able to match 20 year old DNA found at one of the murder scenes to this guy's wife his ex-wife right is that matched her dna and they're like oh well she was out of town but he might have had hair of hers stuck to his clothing that then fell off mm -hmm. well he's a good example too because the police can also look at these the cell phone data right you know messages that were sent his like searches on google which are pretty disturbing right and that that all connects jack the ripper didn't have google there was nothing to see there he didn't have a cell phone right i think that might be another reason why cases like this are so fascinating because you could just disappear like he did like you or harder to track down yeah and it could have been anybody it could have been the most reputable person you know who really was like your doctor that you went to when yeah. something went wrong but then he's out there killing people you'd have no way of knowing right yeah it's scary on september 30th in quick succession, succession, two women are killed or two their bodies are found elizabeth stride who's number three and Catherine. Ed Owls, right. who's number four. And Elizabeth Stride was the one where it was like, he basically was about to get caught and had to leave before he could do much damage. Yeah. And then he went and found Catherine Eddowes. And then she's killed like super viciously. Right. And the police think that was like a rage response to being interrupted. Yeah. yeah. And then Mary Jane Kelly was like a month later. Yeah. yeah. And then she's the final victim. So he's like pretty active in the next. I mean, we said this last time, but it's kind of all this happens in a very short period of time from the very end of august to the beginning of november yeah that's the other interesting thing is like he did five killings in the matter of like two months and then just stopped mm -hmm. and it's not like police were ever very close to catching him it seems so yeah it's really interesting that somebody would just stop doing this unless they died or right. were put in prison or went to america or something right yeah i guess the only other thing i wanted to like just briefly touch on was i thought it was it's interesting that there there are similarities between like 
this case and H.H. H. Holmes in terms of the newspaper coverage. The H.H. H. Holmes coverage was very exaggerated right. and the Jack the Ripper coverage, they, they did lean into the, the bloody and the macabre and everything in, in a similar way at, at a similar time, yeah. which I think has crystallized both those cases in the collective memory. I think Jack the Ripper, if the letters are to be believed, which I was looking up which ones they actually attribute to him and there's the Dear Boss one, the From Hell letter, mm -hmm. there's the Saucy Jack postcard. Hmm. I don't know that one. Yeah, neither did I. But it was received on October 1st at the Central News Agency. Had very similar handwriting to the Dear Boss letter. This postcard mentions the double murder before it happened. Mm. But a lot of people think that still might have been a hoax, but they kind of count that. That was before the From Hell one. There was another one on... October 29th, which was sent to Dr. Thomas Openshaw, uh, who had performed the medical examination on the portion of the kidney that was sent with the From Hell letter. Hmm. Yeah, I know Dear Boss and From Hell are like the two big letters of his, but it seems like there were at least a number of other ones where the credibility is maybe there. But I'm sure there were dozens, if not hundreds, of ones that were just completely hoaxes. Yeah, for sure. Which is so, so sad that people were like, haha. I mean, some of them I do think were like newspaper men oh, being yeah. like i'm gonna yeah. do this and not, not people like going for like a laugh or something but it's either way it's pretty horrible yeah oh uh, here we go here's the saucy jack postcard it reads i was not codding dear old boss when i gave you the tip you'll hear about saucy jackie's work tomorrow double event this time number one squealed a bit couldn't finish straight off had not got time to get ears off for police thanks for keeping last letter back till i got to work again, Jack the Ripper. Hmm. And that was, it's worth noting, and we can obviously touch on this uh, in a later episode, but part of Catherine Eddowes' ear was found severed, the crime scene. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Saucy Jackie. The next two are going to be interesting, I think, because they happened so close to each other, and then there's this, uh, some letters as a result. Right. Yeah, but the reason I even brought these up in the first place is I think, because we've talked about it before, the theory that H.H. H. Holmes might have been Jack the Ripper. I think H.H. H. Holmes was a very cocky man in the sense of, like, being a con man, mm -hmm. um, and was very, like, flippant about the fact that he often ripped people off, but he didn't seem to brag too much publicly about his murders. Whereas yeah. Jack the Ripper definitely seemed more like taunting, more like, yep, I'm going to do another killing. Catch me if you can. Good luck. Whereas H.H. H. Holmes was right. like, I'm going to get out of here, go sell some right. snake oil to these people, dance around a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. H.H. H. Holmes wasn't like bragging about his murders. He did them as quietly as possible right. so he could get money from people right. and then moved on to the next victim. So just another way to discredit that ridiculous theory. Yeah, it is pretty ridiculous. Although I think the the idea that Jack the Ripper like was like I better get out of England things are getting hot and like immigrated somewhere else is sort of a chilling yeah. idea. Yeah, like I said, it's just a lot more similarities between her and um, Marianne Nichols than I realized. Andy Chapman was, what, 47? I think so, yeah. Nichols was 43. Who was the youngest? I think it was Mary Jane Kelly, but I'm not sure. She was fairly young. That's what I thought. So I know that Catherine Eddowes was in her 40s, I believe, as well. Interesting. How old was Elizabeth Stride? She was 44. Catherine Eddowes was 46, and Mary Jane Kelly was maybe 25. Hmm. Her whole story kind of is kind of, no one knew anything about her. Yeah. Not even like the man she was seeing. So, you know, it's interesting too, like that they're all in their 40s. And it, it, you mentioned like this idea of sex workers maybe being like younger, but maybe Jack the Ripper, like, was specifically targeting women in their 40s and like there was something there about his victim type very possible i yeah i don't know if anyone's ever really yeah a lot of them were in their 40s and maybe that had something to do with it maybe it didn't impossible to tell Ugh, this mortuary photograph of elizabeth stride oh, i know Ugh. there's some like just gnarly photos of the victims not for weak stomachs yeah the mary jane kelly one is whew. yeah and they're like on wikipedia which is sort of horrifying and sort of fascinating that they're all out there i mean they're like public this. domain yeah i guess so i just I, I feel like it's rare that we come across autopsy photos yeah in our line of work even though we cover what we cover yeah. even like older stuff i found crime scene photos of the um amityville murders too which was pretty nasty oh. yeah sometimes i come across crime scene photos yeah 
I'm often glad when I can't. Mm -hmm. Because if I can, I have to include them and then I have to look at them. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess we'll be back next time with history happy hour, which is good to know for us because I (laughs) we need to prepare that. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. Although we've got plenty of time. We're good. True. I say now. Yeah, stick around for History Happy Hour coming up next, and then we'll we'll be diving right back in to the Jack the Ripper story with the uh, back-to-back killings, and then the final victim, and then a little discussion at the end all about theories about who the Ripper may or may mm-hmm. not have been. All those suspects. There are so many suspects. We had to really narrow it down. Yeah, to some of the ones that might actually have some credulity to them. <laughs> Did I use that word right? Is uh, No. No, I didn't. Some credibility. <laughs> credibility was the word I was definitely meaning. <laughs> credulity is a tendency to be ready to believe something is real. So it's like credulous. Yes. Instead of incredulous. Hmm. Interesting. Well, now we learned something. Yeah. It's a, it's a mix of likely suspects and really unlikely suspects. Yeah, because that's fun say. to talk about, too. Well, and there's so many wild ones out there that it's like, yeah, let's dive into those, too. Yeah. Didn't they accuse one of the royals? They did. Potentially? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those royals, they do get up to some bad stuff sometimes. So yeah. I think I've mentioned it before, but there was a conspiracy theory that Queen Elizabeth was a cannibal. So the second, the one who just died. <laughs> Is that why she lived for so long? That's what they think. <laughs> There's not a lot of evidence. There is like one Reddit thread of somebody talking about it, but it's kind of funny. Is it because like her sister didn't live very long? So she like not a cannibal. She also drank a lot more. So that also probably took its toll. Yeah. Little of this, little of that. Little human blood, you know. Yeah. Just in your red wine. No one will yeah, notice. Exactly. Yeah. Punch it up. Yeah, check out more stuff about Jack the Ripper on Uh, Mm allthatsinteresting.com. If you want to become a member there, allthatsinteresting.com slash membership will let you do that. That gets you uh, an ad-free experience on the website, also supports us. And if you want to join the newsletter to keep up to date with what's going on over at allthatsinteresting.com, that'll be allthatsinteresting.com slash sign up. Yes. Uh, as always, if you have a question about the show, a story you'd like to us to cover or want to say hello, you can call us and leave a voicemail at 929-526-3029, or you can email us at podcast at allisinteresting.com. And we love to hear from people. It's always exciting. Yeah, we've gotten some nice emails lately. We got a voicemail, which we will talk about next week. That's right. The voicemail that we got from uh, a listener. So that was very cool and exciting. We also have to watch that episode of, was it Law and Order? Law and Order, Order. yeah, Yeah. which I have never watched before. (laughs) We have a little bit of homework to do, which I guess is true every day because we work from home. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) that's true. (laughs) All right, well then, till next time. Till next time. (laughs)